Hello again. Many of you have corresponded with us over the last couple of months in respect to your continuing struggle with the doctrine of Christ's person, the deity of Christ. So I th there's a quote I found that I, I think you might find helpful. It has to do with the, the necessity of God veiling himself in some way to, c to communicate with humans. And I thought Charles Cranfield's comment in his study, Greek Testament study of the Gospel of Mark, would be very helpful here. Cranfield nowadays is much better known for this set. Two volumes on Romans, one of the greatest commentaries on Romans ever produced, and that's saying a lot because many of the greatest theologians and Bible commentators have tried Romans on for size. This one was received with great acclamation. It was published between 1975 and 1979. Here's what Cranfield has to say about the way God communicated to us through Christ. God's kingly intervention in the person, works, and words of Jesus is a secret. And the word secret is from the Greek word mysterion. In the sense that it can only be recognized by a God-given faith. This secret of the kingdom of God is the secret of Jesus' messiahship and the secret of his divine sonship. God's self-revelation is indirect and veiled. While the eye of faith sees through the veil and grasps the secret, for the unbeliever, so long as he remains an unbeliever, the veil is unpenetrated, and everything is still simply in parables. No outwardly compelling evidence of divine glory illumines the ministry of Jesus. It is a necessary part of the gracious self-abasement of the Incarnation that the Son of God should submit to conditions under which his claim to authority cannot be cannot but appear altogether problematic and paradoxical. In the last hours of his life, his incognito deepens until in the helplessness, nakedness, and agony of the cross, abandoned by God and man, he becomes the absolute antithesis of everything that the world understands by divinity and by kingship. But this veiledness is not simply designed to prevent men from recognizing the truth. God's self-revelation is truly revelation. It is precisely veiled revelation. Throughout the ministry, we can see these two motifs, revealing and veiling, at work. On the one hand, Jesus gathers the crowds about him and teaches them, sends out the twelve to preach, and reveals the power and compassion of God by his miracles. God's self-revelation is not to be accomplished in a corner. On the other hand, Jesus teaches the crowds indirectly by means of parables, seeks to conceal his miracles, and forbids the demoniacs to, the, to declare his identity. The two motives, both of which are necessary to the divine purpose, are constantly in tension, a fact which explains some apparent inconsistencies. Between several commands, for instance, in uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 3, and his frequent injunctions to silence, Mark, by the way, has been called by many of its commentators the, the gospel of the secret or something akin to that phrase. Cranfield goes on, By this veiled revelation, men are placed in a situation of crisis. A separation between faith and unbelief is brought about, and the blindness and sinfulness of men are shown up for what they are. That this is the judgment, for instance, in John chapter 9, verse 39, is part of the divine purpose is indicated by the the references in verse 12 of this chapter but it is not the whole purpose of God his ultimate purpose is salvation and the latter part of verse 12 that is in Mark chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 the latter part of verse 12 is perhaps to be interpreted as was suggested above as hinting at this God's self-revelation is veiled in order that men may, may be left sufficient room in which to make a personal decision. Let me read that sentence again. God's self-revelation is veiled in order that men may be left sufficient room in which to make a personal decision. A real turning to God or repentance is made possible by the inward divine enabling of the Holy Spirit, but would be rendered impossible 
by the external compulsion of a manifestation of the unveiled divine majesty. The revelation is veiled for the sake of man's freedom to believe. Do we have to simplify that? Well, if we do, I suppose it would be along the lines that a manifestation like God's self-manifestation at Mount Sinai would compel men to believe, but that is not the way of the gospel. Men believed in the case of the ten plagues in Egypt and in the case of the manifestations at the Red Sea and the manifestations at Sinai because they were compelled to believe, you might say, by fear. And fear is not faith, and faith is the gift of God in the gospel. So Cranfield I found very helpful in explaining why it is that the Gospels have this double-sidedness. On the one hand, Christ manifests the glory of God continuously, but not always. That is, selectively, you might say. I would always advocate for Cranfield. He's written not only these two commentaries on Romans and Mark, but also a little one on First Peter, which I greatly benefited from.